Um, so welcome, good morning. Um, I, uh, so I'm a family doctor, as you heard. I've been practicing a, about 17 years now, and it's <clears throat> taken me really amazing places and really with courageous people, um, working in, in monasteries and prisons from San Francisco's Tenderloin to Sierra Leone, Kampa, Tibet, Kampong Cham, and, and now actually Upper Manhattan. I spent the last four years as the president of Doctors Without Borders, or it's also known as we're known in the field as MSF or Médecins Sans Frontières. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the organization, we're an international and independent medical humanitarian organization. The point is to try to treat people in distress, whether due to man-made or natural disaster, violent conflicts, epidemics, malnutrition, all these things. Um, we were founded, um, and we started in 1971 by a small group of doctors and journalists. Some of them had been working in, Nia in, in um, Nigeria during the um, War of Secession in Biafra. And really, they were there amongst incredibly horrible conditions for the population. Uh, injury and disease, but also widespread malnutrition and a great many deaths. And they were working there under an organization that restricted them from telling what they were doing and what they were seeing there. When they returned home, they broke ranks to speak out publicly about the conditions there to raise awareness of what was going on, and they decided that a new organization was needed, one that would c provide really concrete medical assistance and also retain individual conscience in its association, the idea that one voice, an individual's voice, shouldn't be denied or subverted to law or to an organization or to anything else. Um, this is the, the picture of the founders. Um, it, looks, um, actually, it looks incredibly official, or at least as formal as French doctors in the 70s could look, maybe. But um, in truth, actually, and here you see Médecins Sans Frontières has become a reality. In, in fact, this was nowhere near the truth. They had no path laid out whatsoever. They had no sense even of how they were going to get to the field, what they were going to do there, um, and certainly no sense at all about what they were going to become. So as I talk to you right now, we, have, um, we are 27,000 people in the field providing care right now as we speak. We saw 8 million patients last year and in uh, 65 countries. Here in the US, there are over 700,000 supporters and we take no US government funding to do this work. Um, and I've been thinking a lot over these years about how, how is it that we got from there where really there was no sense not knowing at all the way how we got from that point to here where we are now, what went into that and how did that, how did that happen? And certainly there were a lot of missteps along the way, but I think that there are four key practices, four things that have really grounded us and guided us and taken us through it. So this is the first, this is not actually a misspelling of design, that's um, been, actually design is a whole other talk for MSF, it's quite interesting, but this is Dasein, it's the word that uh, the philosopher Heidegger used, and it's translated as being in the world. And what this means is to, um, um, is to be, there's extra clicks necessary here. Anyway, but this, this means is to, as an individual, not separate, but connected and involved and engaged in the world, the people, the, the, the community around you. For me, this is the really the core, absolutely, of being a doctor, is to be with the patient, in the room with the patient, listening to them, understanding, and really seeking to, to understand and be with the experience that they're going through. Um, the, we use, in MSF for a long time, we've used the French word, I think, or maybe not. We've stopped speaking French. There we go. Ah! Oh, see, now I've got to start all over. Anyway, it's the French word témoignage, um, and what that means is um, witnessing or bearing witness. There we go. Okay. Um, so this témoignage, um, bearing witness, and what, what it, this really is, it's more than just proximity or being close to, but really about solidarity with the patients. 
This kind of solidarity is why I, in between missions with MSF, went to work inside San Quentin State Prison. A colleague of mine who'd started there said this wasn't the underserved, this was the completely unserved. And to be able to enter in, enter into cell blocks in cells where patients were and to, and to try to meet the needs that they had there, this for me is, is really what, what drives me and I think a lot of us who do work like this. Um, it's why MSF now is working inside Afghanistan, including in Taliban-controlled areas, to do work because that's where it's needed. Why we continue to put teams and do work inside Somalia, despite the really very great personal risk they have of working there. So I think this is not, you know, this being with, it's not limited to medicine for sure. It's for any of us and what we do. This, this feeling of really being present, listening, seeking to understand the other's experience to, to be there with them. The second practice is the ethics of refusal. I think in the course of this work, with the sometimes very intimate work with others, we run into things that are inadequate or just unacceptable. And in this way, we, I think we have to speak up and speak out and refuse them. An example is um, that until quite recently, the treatment for African sleeping sickness was a drug called Malarsoprol. This is a, a, a derivative of arsenic. And what we were doing was we were actually poisoning our patients in order to try to get rid of the disease. And about one in 20 died from the treatment itself. Now this is a situation completely unacceptable. And there were zero, there were no drugs in development to replace this. It's even more outrageous when one of the molecules that's used now was actually in production, but only to be used in a cream for cosmetics to get rid of hair on the upper lip. That was the only reason that the drug company was making it. So in response, MSF sought out these alternatives and really sought out to find a way to find better treatments and alternatives where, when none existed. And it was actually my friend and a fellow doctor, Uni Karunakara, who helped put these first protocols and the first treatment in place. And he just described a, a hospital ward transformed, not just the patients who, who no longer had really fire in their veins that was going in, and the medical staff completely transformed by being able to give something that was safe and effective. The next thing is a, a culture of debate, and I think that no matter what the success you have, it's a role and responsibility of all involved to really question and challenge the principles that you hold in the first place, but the relevance and impact of what you're doing. Um, we have an ongoing debate on a number of things. One of the examples is right now the work that we've been doing in Myanmar. We work there under a government that's a military junta and there's extremely severe restrictions. We're limited to 19 international staff for whatever the size of our programs in the whole country and it, we're required to give one month's notice before any travel from literally one village to the next or going from the capital out to programs that we already have there. Over the years, we've chosen to make these compromises in order to reach patients, and the result is that we're taking care of the vast majority of HIV patients in that country who are on medication. There are 20,000 of them who are in our programs right now. But at the same time, I, I really have to call into question that we're using protocols for those patients that are well below the standard, and at the same time, that, we've had, that we're unable to take care of other patients in the country and very limited ability to respond to ethnic minorities or people living in border areas. And though we do some sort of behind the doors uh, advocacy, we're really unable to have any public speech about the, what's going on and the conditions there. So what do we do when impartiality, independence, principles like this have to be given up for access to some of the patients, or when quality of care is pitted against just managing the increasing numbers. I don't have the final answers to these, but I think that the debate is necessary, and even more so, the more committed we are and the more passionate about the work we do, the more we have to question and discuss it. The last uh, practice is being in action. As, as a doctor, the, the purpose in the end is to get treatment to patients, to reach them and to treat them now. Our goal isn't charity care, just bringing whatever's possible, but incorporating in an ongoing way medical and logistic innovations, and sometimes the care we provide exceeds that which is available here in the US. Other times that we can't reach patients at all, where it's too risky or our access is restricted by, by governments or by militaries armed actors, or like I described, we don't have good enough tools or drugs or knowledge to do it right. 
I arrived in Sierra Leone in 2002, um, in just after 10 years of civil war there, uh, in the southern district of Moyamba, uh, there were two doctors for 500,000 people, and I made the third. Um, there are two main killers in the pediatric wards at that time. They were malaria and malnutrition. And I arrived just, just uh, as rainy season started, and in the main ward, there were kids everywhere on cribs, on beds, on mats on the floor, sometimes two to a bed, and then overflowing outside and in tents that had been set up. But at the same time, in the, the main ward for malaria, we had a new rapid diagnostic simple card treatment uh, test. It could be done at the bedside and a new combination therapy. And this was an extremely safe and extremely effective cure for, for these patients. And we were able to, to take care of not all, but almost all, all of the patients who came in. Then you go outside this ward and walk across the dirt grounds to the feeding center. And though it looked quite the same inside, for malnutrition, it was a completely different story. Um, we had, um, it, there, we had to use a kind of a therapeutic milk. It needed to be sterilized. It was extremely, um, had to be carefully uh, calculated what we were giving and had to be given one spoon at a time, a spoonful sometimes every hour in order to treat these patients. And in truth, it was hard and slow and difficult and we really struggled there to take care of them. There's a huge difference in the impact you can have in these, these kinds of, just these two wards side by side. But still, I think this is, it's being in action. It's vitally important to keep going, to, to continue to work on what matters, and to keep insisting on getting better. There are really a great many challenges in our civil society in global health. Um, th there is a great imbalance in access to medical care, um, and I, this is not fundamentally a question of money. I don't believe that at all. It's really a question of uh, moral courage and the political will in the choices that we make. There is drug research and trade policy that continues to put profits above and before people and patients who need help. And there are still many neglected patients. They're marginalized, untreated, caught in conflicts, or here at home, the poor, the uninsured, or the undocumented, and regardless of your politics, they're here and part of our society, and we know that they don't get the medical care that they need. So MSF began really as an unformed idea. Those French doctors had a medical humanitarian identity, but in order to grow and continue to evolve to meet the needs of patients, we have to depend on individuals practicing these things I've talked about, this um, bearing witness and being in action, an ethics of refusal and a culture of debate. MSF is not unique at all in these practices, and my hope is that more individuals will choose them, more, indiv uh, more ideas that they have will take form, and better paths will be created to meet the needs of our neighbors in our global society, whether they're very, very far away or they're right here at home. Thank you.